we are putting on a conference called Evolution Exposed. We pulled in experts on the subject of evolution for a total of 11 speakers and gave them just 15 minutes to give us their best. And on top of all that, a one hour Q&A panel session. You're going to love Evolution Exposed. Anyone can refute evolution. Due to the zoo, to me and you. All that a fairy tale. Not allowed to ask questions. It made evolution look ridiculous. That was the foolishness of atheism. I yeah. knew I was going to get corrected. No, I wasn't even listening to your answer. <laughs> uh, <fairy tale. laughs> this guy might be coming for you. Welcome to Apologia, and another installment of Evolution Exposed, Exposed. Our claim-by-claim -claim investigation of the Creation All-Star Mega Seminar. If you'd like to catch the series from the beginning, tap on the playlist above my head. After the hard act to follow Ken Ham, the conference's next speaker was Dr. Jason Lyle, a regular creation freelancer with ICR, AIG, and his own solo ministry. He was ready to pull no punches and ask the hard questions. Is evolution the anti-science? Because we've all heard this secular narrative that evolution is the scientific view and uh, evolution in the Darwinian sense, along with the Big Bang and the billions of years, the deep time. And the, the narrative is that creation is unscientific, right? Positing something supernatural, whatever it may be, is definitely definitionally unscientific, as science asks questions that are limited to the natural realm. This would generally apply to any notion of intelligent design. Most scientists of the Christian persuasion fully acknowledge and support this scientific scope called methodological naturalism. They are separate magistrates. Though he's right, in that the kind of young earth creationism espoused by Jason and the other speakers does make the occasional actual scientific prediction, and these predictions tend to fail every time. In that limited sense, young earth brand creation could be accurately described as unscientific. Believing in the Bible, you know, that, that's not science. Correct. Just as believing in free speech isn't science. Believing in yourself isn't science. Not everything is science. What I find very ironic is this claim that, that evolution is the scientific view because I found that the exact opposite is true. Namely, creation is the scientific position because it's what makes science possible. The scientific method... Jason is confused. The scientific method is a philosophy, not a science. On the other hand, whether or not it is true, biological evolution is a scientific claim that makes testable predictions that can be studied using the philosophy of the scientific method. So it is science. He's making a category error, causing conflation confusion, because two different things both have the word science in the title based on the premise that biblical creation is true. The scientific method doesn't require that biblical creation be true. It requires only uniformity, the notion that the natural world acts predictably over time. Some flavors of creationism are indeed compatible with uniformity, though others seem to throw uniformity out the window when it doesn't suit them. Take radiometric decay rates, for example. It's very, very likely that the uh, half-life of uh, radioactive species like uh, uranium has changed rapidly in the past. And if you recognize that, then really anyone can refute evolution uh, by pointing out that science is predicated on three biblical creation principles. Before we get to those principles, I'd like to take a second to thank our sponsor, Atlas VPN. Remember last year when I spent a month compiling this recreation of Star Wars A New Hope without using a single clip from Star Wars A New Hope? A lot of those sources are no longer commercially available, so finding them took me to some pretty sketchy corners of the internet where I definitely did not want to be tracked. Or earlier this year when I put together this virtual mega debate with Kent Hovind, to assemble that, without exaggeration, I had to download thousands of videos and transcripts. Did you know that YouTube blocks your IP address when you start archiving a whole channel? Well, they do. These are just two examples of recent projects that would have been literally impossible if I wasn't protecting my connection with a VPN. Well, right now, the fine folks at Atlas VPN are running a huge discount for Apologia subscribers. For a limited time, you can join over 6 million users worldwide and get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's 82% off today for you. So tap on the link in the video description below to get started today. And it's not just protection. 
If you're Canadian like me, you probably have no idea of the mountain of shocking faith-based programming just waiting to be discovered when you use Atlas VPN to convince Netflix, Prime, or Disney that you're actually in America. Or if you're American, you can escape your theocracy with unique content from literally anywhere else in the world. If you'd like to stay away from prying eyes of all kinds, increase your security, head off identity theft, expand your streaming media options, and do it all for a limited time offer of 82% off, head over today to get.atlas.com slash and you'll also be supporting this channel and its mission. All right, back to Jason. Really, anyone can refute evolution uh, by pointing out that science is predicated on three biblical creation principles, and they are the following. First of all, the reliability of our senses. The idea that what I see and what I taste and touch and smell and hear and so on is, <clears throat> is basically real. It's it, that my senses are informing me truly about the external universe. I have been waiting my whole life for this moment. Literally every decision I've made in my life has been carefully designed to lead me here to this point. So I can talk about sensory perception with... Wait, who's Jason Lyle? Trust me, you don't want to know. An astrophysicist? An astrophysicist. They chose someone whose field of expertise is literally not grounded on this actual planet to discuss neuroscience? Yeah, you know, actually that tracks, it tracks. And so it turns out that it's evolution, not creation, that turns out to be the anti-science. And so let's explore these, uh, these creationist principles. First of all, the reliability of the senses. Uh, this, of course, is necessary for science because science involves observation. You do your experiment, you observe the results. Now that would do no good if our observations were unreliable, if our sensory organs had nothing to do with the external world, that wouldn't make any sense at all. I mean, this is trivially true, but I have a premonition that this is about to fly off the rails. Now, in the Christian worldview, I have a good reason to trust my senses. They have been designed by God for the purpose of informing me about the external world. I am a prophet, confirmed. <laughs> I suppose it's not enough to simply plant your flag in the concept of morality, logic, and truth in order to be truly dominant. You need to have the market cornered on the very perception of the entirety of reality. Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12, that God made the hearing ear and the seeing eye. They're designed, it's, and they're designed to work. Maybe not perfectly because of sin and the curse, I understand that, but nonetheless, they are designed. Okay, I have questions, like just, just so many questions. <laughs> if the limitations of, let's say, our visual system are entirely the result of some chick eating an apple, what did eyes look like prior to, you know, like the fall or whatever? If you have a robust understanding of our existing visual neuroanatomy, you know full well that the limits aren't simply qualitative. They're based on how light operates in general in relation to our sensory organs, namely our eyes. For a second, let's just ignore the fact that we were made in God's perfect image, and yet somehow every species of birds has four types of photoreceptive cones in their retina to our three and can see a broader spectrum of color than us, and that there are species of literal ants that can detect polarization in the atmosphere to utilize for navigation, even though we cannot, because it's odd to me that sin would degrade our visual system specifically, yet allow other species to exceed us in that capacity. But I digress because my questions are about what the material reality of this would entail. It seems to me that he's positing that our visual systems as humans were somehow previously perfect but due to sin, they've digressed towards their current state. But those imperfections are structural. Because of the construction of our eyes and the manner in which light operates, everything we see is initially upside down, backwards, blurry, and full of holes. Now, it's a well-established fact, based on the objectively sourced YouTube comments that I've come across, that I am, in fact, an idiot. But it seems incomprehensible to me that our eyes and visual neuroanatomy were somehow entirely different structurally than they are now prior to a snake telling a woman the truth about a tree. The reason our visual system isn't optimal isn't due at all to degradation. It's because light travels in a straight line and the eye is concave in the photoreceptive area. This means that light on our right visual field hits the retina where it's processed on the left side of each eye, vice versa for the left visual field. The same for the visual fields on the top and the bottom. And adding an additional level of complexity, our eyes are filled with viscous liquid called vitreous humor. This liquid further distorts the pure reflection of the light bouncing off any given distal stimuli that we're perceiving. 
Let's also not forget that in order for our brain to receive any information at all about our visual world, we need the optic nerve to leave the eye. This leaves us with a massive blind spot in our visual field because we can't have any photoreceptors in this area at all. I mean, I could go on and on about this. I could discuss the function of opsins, which are the photoreactive proteins on the retina, or how our color receptive cones are only in one tiny portion of our retina called the fovea. The fact that in order to unify our visual fields, the optic tract must first split in the midbrain at the optic chiasm. But it all ends in this question. How? How were they ever perfect? Sin doesn't explain the shortcomings of the existing visual anatomy we have, but it being a consistently evolving adaptation very likely does. And even more importantly, if they were perfect, if they truly were, and we could see colors like birds and polarization like ants and everything we perceived wasn't upside down, backwards, and full of holes, and reliant on our brain to put the pieces together, What did our eyes and the accompanying anatomy look like when they were perfect? They couldn't have been spheres unless light somehow worked differently then. They couldn't have had an optic nerve creating a blind spot. The path of the optic nerves wouldn't have had to split the optic chiasm in the midbrain because they were perfect. Eating that apple must have been exceedingly painful. Because once that's in set in, the entirety of Adam and Eve's ocular anatomy, both internally and externally, would have been entirely rewritten on the spot. The people created in the image of God would have been fundamentally reconstructed in an instant so that this astrophysicist could justify to himself writing off all of our perceptual shortcomings to picking fruit from the wrong tree. Whereas in the secular worldview, our sensory organs are not designed by any intelligence at all. They're simply an accident of nature. And so why would they be reliable? Now, some evolutionists might say, oh, but I can see that my senses are basically reliable. But what are you using to evaluate your senses? You're using your senses, right? You're saying, well, yeah, I can, I can, you know, it's all, it all makes sense. It all works together. But how do you know it's not all a lie? How do you know that your senses really are reliable? Some evolutionists might say, but natural selection guided the development of my sensory organs. Natural selection would only tend to preserve traits that have survival value, not necessarily reliability or truthfulness. Wait, does he think that being able to effectively navigate the environment you're in isn't a beneficial survival trait? Starting out at its most rudimentary level, just having photoreceptive cells capable of detecting light tells you a great deal about your environment you wouldn't have otherwise had available to you. When extrapolated over time, additional optic abilities couldn't be seen as much else aside from beneficial adaptations. It also seems reasonable to me that the more accurate those perceptions are in general, the better adapted to survival and prone to procreation success you'd be. And so, uh, you know, you, you don't need, depending on what kind of organism you are, you don't need senses at all to survive. Grass doesn't have sensory organs and it survives perfectly well. In fact, it's going a lot better than we are by the numbers, a lot more blades of grass on the planet than human beings. And, and, but the secular says, but I'm not a blade of grass. And so, you know, my sensory organs, sensory organs would help me survive. But how do you know you're not a blade of grass? That's what I want to know. So I can see that, it, oh yeah, yeah, because you see, you're assuming that your senses are reliable in order to inform you that you have reliable senses. How do you know that all your sensory experiences are not in reality simply the byproduct of photosynthesis? How do you know you're not a blade of grass? And in the secular worldview, there's no answer to that. They could, you could argue that you perceive that you're not, but again, your perceptions could just be the byproduct of photosynthesis. Okay, well, that was easily the strangest form of solipsism I've ever come across. <laughs> I'm also assuming they don't require much botany as a prerequisite for a degree in astrophysics because I did three seconds search on Google Scholar and found loads of studies about plant sensory systems. I gave one of them to Paul to link down below. His overreaching point here seems to be that you need to use your senses in order to validate the accuracy of your senses. That's only trivially true, though. We're able to communicate corroboration with others to verify our senses, and they are, in fact, so inaccurate in judgments that we've created a multitude of measurement tools as well. We incorporate various forms of external checks and balances to validate our sensory experiences precisely because they're flawed. And not some lady ate an apple and now I can't see in 4K clarity flawed, but we all see illusory images on the regular flawed. 
I don't quite understand how an assertion that God granted these senses to us changes or explains anything. If he did give them to us, he created them flawed and imperfect and granted other animals not in his image superior iterations in several regards. Secularists say, but, but you Christians assume your senses are reliable, and that's true. But we have a good reason for it. Our senses have been designed by God. It makes sense. And I'll grant that I must first use my sensory organs to read the Bible and find that they've been designed by God, but it's consistent. I'm justified. I'm vindicated after the fact in trusting in my sensory organs. And frankly, God has hardwired that knowledge into me and into all of us. Babies are born knowing that their senses are basically reliable. And then when they get a little bit older and learn how to read and they read the Bible, they find that they had a good reason to trust in their senses all along because their senses were designed by God. Whereas in the secular worldview, there would be no reason to trust in sensory experience. Paul, where in the Bible does it explicitly say, hey, little Johnny, you can trust your senses. I, I feel like it's just not even in there. Not specifically, no. Revelation 2.29 says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Psalm 34.8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's about as affirming as it gets. And those are both about seeing virtue, not like the sunset. Jason is right that the Bible affirms that God designed these systems. Ears that hear and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. But each of those seems to fly in the face of this idea that the eyes or ears fundamentally changed when Adam and Eve sinned. God seems to be taking credit for them as originally implemented and patting himself on the back. And far from endorsing the reliability of the senses, one of the most quoted verses in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5-7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Huge thanks as always to Shannon Q., whom you can find rattling cages on Twitter, questioning doctrines on TikTok, elevating the discourse on her YouTube channel, or co-hosting the Atheist Experience call-in show. Next time on Evolution Exposed Exposed, Jason gives us the second of his three anti-evolution principles. Second, the rationality of the mind, the idea that our, our mind is basically capable of using laws of logic, considering the various options, and then choosing the best. We're capable of considering various options, but are we all actually capable of choosing the best? We shall see. We shall see. And I'll see you over there. <laughs>